The game of football is life. That's it. The game of football is life. You're building a certain spirit. You're building a certain individual because the thing you have to understand, one day you're going to be removed from this game and this jersey will be off your back. And the same way you approach this game, that's the same way you approach life. Everybody don't take it as personal as me. I take this thing personal because I laid my life on the line for it. You can ask anybody. I laid my life on the line for this. I laid my life on the line between the lines. So I take this thing right here, I take it personal. I don't know about you all, but every time you take the field, I expect you to win. I say that with every ounce of my spirit. You will never hear me speak about Tennessee and say I expect them to lose a game. Because I know the moment that you get it, the moment that you figure out this game has nothing to do with skill and it's about will, won't nobody beat you. Won't nobody want it better than you. Because somebody's going to blink. And don't let it be you. And that's my time. God bless you all, man. Let's go. Thank you. Kirkwood, it's a lot nicer than it was back when I came up. But it's still a place that, that you need to be weary of. The dynamics of the neighborhood, it was a very rough neighborhood. Um, a lot of crime, a lot of killing, a lot of violence, a lot of gangs. You should have a goal, one of the little rollaway goals. I was playing by myself and that's when the ball rolled. I got down here and I looked up in there and he was sitting there and he was sitting and he was shooting it up just like that. And he just looked at me. It made me realize, you know, I never want to do that, man, because that guy just looked hopeless. Looked like he had nothing to live for. Took care about 125 Warren Street. It's still 125. It's two bedroom home. You know, it's 14 of us, one bathroom. And uh, we used to sleep on the floor. We would make pallets. You see roaches and rats running across you while you're in the home. When he got a chance to sleep in the bed, it was six of them in the bed, three to the top and three at the bottom. And there was time we struggled when, you know, you wonder where your next meal is coming from. And uh, most of my uncles, they sold drugs. My grandfather sold drugs to provide for the family. So you're a kid, man, and the cops would just kick down your door and they would raid your home. And it's 10, 11 cops. You know, and they're flipping things over. And you watch them grab your grandfather out of his wheelchair with no legs. And they slam him on his face in front of you. And this happened on more than one occasion. You know, and you're a kid, man. This scares the crap out of you, man. And so you're watching all this transpire, and you're like, man, I never, ever want to take my family through anything of this nature. for a long time, man, ever since I was a kid. You know, I felt like my calling was sports. You know, and that's what God put me on this earth to do, and so I wanted to become an NFL player. I kept him around people like my brother-in-law and my sister to keep him out of the area. So I kept him around positive people and kept him involved in sports. I used to always think that hopefully that would take his mind away from the situation that was going on at home. He could play any sport, run, jump, you know, basketball, football, probably one of the best players in any sport he played. When I would play sports, I wouldn't play with guys my age. I would always play with older guys. And so I would leave the basketball court, nose bloody, you know, lips busted, you know, scratches, scars all over me. And so now, when I played with kids my age, yeah, I was the smallest guy, but I was one of the toughest guys because I was so used to playing with grown guys and teenagers when I was young. Tennessee came then, you know, they believed in me from day one, you know, so when they did that and I look back and the first team that I ever played football for in rec league was the Tennessee Volunteers, I think it was, it was predestined, you know, and so I said, man, I'm going up the rocky top. From all his environment where he's from, he wasn't, he wasn't supposed to make it. And so he put a chip on his shoulder for when he got an opportunity. So he had to come to school with, a, with you know, a mission, to prove himself. When I stepped on campus, my first media day, a reporter asked me, do I even think I'm gonna play at the University of Tennessee? I was 5'9", 153 pounds. I worked just as hard as anybody else to get my scholarship. And so now when I stepped on the field, it wasn't backing down to anybody. 
ultimately I was playing for God, but also I was playing for my family. I was playing for the people that believed in me. That's why when I took that field up in Notre Dame and Coach Charlie Weiss called me out and said, we're coming at Inky Johnson today. Either Inky Johnson is gonna be a great player for Tennessee or he's gonna be a great player for Notre Dame. And I went out and I dominated him. That's why when I went into Florida, into the swamp, and first or second possession, I think, and I came off the end and I sat Chris Leak. But I just played, man, with this, this belief. Crazy as all get out, unbelievable. I thought, who is this little guy? <laughs> Throw his, threw his body around, always talking noise, but it was something about it. I was at the height of my career. I was strong as I'd ever been in my life. I was as fast as I'd ever been in my life. You know, my football IQ was through the roof. I was on track to graduate. Everything was in shape in my life. You know, I said, man, you know, nine more games. You know, I'm in the NFL. I don't care what anybody says. I just knew that that cycle was broken from what our family had went through. He was the first one in our family on my side to go to college. It was so exciting. You know, things are about to change, you know, and not knowing that things was really about to change. I approached it the way that I always approached the game. There's Inky Johnson, six tackles last week against California. It didn't go as planned. You know, Air Force had a really tough team. It came out, they were running this triple option, it was giving us fits, man. Carney hands it off, touchdown, Ryan Williams. And it's 31 to 23. In the fourth quarter rolled around, Air Force went down, they score. It came back once I kicked the ball to me, I dropped it. Bobbled, bobbled, recovered by Air Force, I think. Yes, they do. Now Air Force has the ball, and they're going for the winning drive in Needless Stadium. So it's a major upset alert and I'm frustrated and I'm mad. And so they come out, throw the ball to a guy running down the sideline by the name of Justin Hanley. And I go to hit them. And uh, at the point of contact, man, something different happened. I changed my life for the rest of my life. Got the pass caught and out of bounds at the 33 yard line. And he did his normal, typical, the way he hit people. And so when he, when he hit the person, he thought, man, Inky done knocked himself out. And then he didn't move. And Inky Johnson is down on the field. Mm, that's not good. You know, when I hit him, it, um, it seemed like everything in my body just left. You know, it, it seemed like every breath in my body just left. My body went completely limp, fell to the ground, I blacked out. You know, my eyes opened and I heard my guy say, Ink, get up, let's go. And I yelled to them, I said, I can't. And there was this shock going through my whole body and I couldn't feel anything. The trainers were bringing out the spine board and he raised my right arm and hand. And I raised my left and I looked at my doctor, I said, oh yeah. I said, I'll be back. And they put me in the ambulance and they took me to the hospital. Uh, the pain increased and, um, you know, things got real intense. Uh, when I was in the hospital after um, I had my CAT scans and the doctor came into the room and I heard him say, hey, got to rush this guy back to emergency surgery. He's about to lose his life. He's about to die. Not knowing, brother, my son is going to come out of this alive. That just did something to I'm sorry. And all I did was pray and I asked God, you know, I can deal with whatever happens, but just don't take my child from me. And they told me what happened was I busted up some clavian artery in my chest. I was bleeding internally. They had to rush me back and take the main vein out of my left leg and plug it into my chest in order to save my life. As they went in to fix the artery, that's where they found the nerve roots had been torn away from his, uh, his spine. So uh, after we was, you know, he was in surgery for a couple of hours, we was in the waiting room, and the doc found me and told and showed me how the nerves had been torn away from his arm. When I came out of recovery, he told me I had some good news and some bad news for you. 
So the good news is you saved your life. You so said the bad news is you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. We don't know how much. Have to send you up to the Mayo Clinic, but you probably can never play the game of football again. And that's when, you know, it got real. Going to the Mayo Clinic, you know, I still didn't believe that, hey man, this could be over. And they went through, they cut me on my left side of my neck, they cut me around the right side of my neck, they cut me all the way down to the bottom of my hand, down my whole arm, they cut me across the right side of my chest. After my surgery, I looked in the mirror, man, and I had all of these staples. And man, I think it's about 300 in my body and my left shoulder, it was up to my ear, it was so swollen. And I was looking in the mirror at myself and I was like, man, I just look so weak. They told me, they said, Ink, here's the deal. They said, you have torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. They said, your brachial plexus is the nerve roots that go from your spine that controls your arm and your hand. They said, you have torn them at all levels. They can't be replugged. They can't be put back in. And so they said, son, I hate to tell you, but your arm, it will never be the same again. They said, your hand will never be the same again. They said, son, you can never play the game of football again. I was 20 years old when that happened. You've been working for something, you know, your whole life, you know, and um, I had given everything I had to it. To even hear that, it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of, uh, of me, you know, being disappointed, so to speak. I was more disappointed for the people that believed in me. You know, I really wanted them to see, hey man, you know, I'm not letting your hard work go in vain. And so in that moment, that hit me. Like, hey man, I might not get the chance to let them see their hard work come to fruition. And a couple of days later, me, my family, and Mitch, and, and all of us, we were out of the hospital, man, and we were back home by Christmas. To know that he wasn't gonna be able to play sports again was one thing, but to know that he would not be able to reach out and to hug me, that was another thing. Just the simple things in life. I thought about all that stuff. What was he gonna do? How was he gonna do it? How would we survive? to take care of Inky. But then I realized Inky's a survival. Inky's gonna take care of Inky. It was a tough process, man, from the standpoint of, um, you know, I can no longer use my right arm and hand. And I have been using this my whole life. And so now you go through a stage where you have to rely on other people. You know, the earlier stages, I had to get people to help me take a bath. And so now you're sitting in disability services. Imagine this, man. You come off of a season where you bench press over 300 pounds. You run a 438. Now you're sitting in a cubicle in disability services. You're writing on a pad and you're trying to learn how to write your name all over again. That's a humbling experience. My whole life had changed. Now I had to find tactics to brush my teeth. You know, now I had to find different tactics to do different things. And the whole time while I was fighting these battles, the only face and the only picture that was in my mind was me telling my grandmother that I was going to graduate college and the smile that she had on her face when I told her that. My grandmother's smile superseded all of that. And so that's what kept me going. Man, it was great, man. I, I got my undergraduate. I went on to get my master's. And so for me getting that, that was a tribute to them. Oh, I still deal with it every day. Every day I'm in pain. It's, uh, it shoots, you know, up and down my arm to my neck, you know, just daily. And that's where I revert back to Kirkwood. 
you know, all of the pain that I felt when I saw my family struggle. And so now I go through it, man, and it has made me so mentally tough that it's crazy. You know, because I get up every day and I do what I need to do and I don't feel sorry for myself. I don't say, well, it's me. I'm honored that God chose me to go through what I go through. All of a sudden, his attitude changed. You know, we can do something different now. We're gonna, this is, we're gonna use this to help people. And it's the product we have now. So it's this proverb in the Bible that says, a man's hunger works for him and his appetite drives him on. And so my question for you all tonight is, what is your appetite for winning? I went and I spoke to some kids. I saw the impact that it had on them. And it had an impact on me. And I said, man, this is pretty cool. And so I've been doing it, you know, for about seven and a half years now. I'm speaking every week, a couple of times every week. And I let God work those things out. I feel like God will send the people, send the companies, send the schools, send the churches that he wants me to speak to. And that's how I live my life. I don't believe in your product and your environment. No, you're a product of your decisions and your choices. Every day you wake up, regardless of what life deals you, regardless of what you go through, regardless of what happens to you, every day you wake up, you have a choice of the attitude you embrace toward life and the perspective that you see life with. When he's speaking, I always take a look around the room to look at the people and people that sit on the edge of their seats. He really captures his audience attention. He really does. It's just like when he got to play. If you could have saw him in the locker room before he played, it's that same guy. I don't know if he would have had a greater impact if he had gone to the NFL and played. Man, we don't know. And we can't answer what else, can we? But I know that where he is now is having a much greater impact than any NFL player probably could have for what he went through. Especially in the state of Tennessee, where everybody knows it. Man, I go back uh, a couple of times a year. And to be a part of that, man, it's a privilege. And I'm grateful for it. The people there, man, in that city, some of the nicest people in the world. You know, I am forever indebted to Knoxville, to the University of Tennessee, because their prayers, their words, and their gratitude got me through one of the toughest times of my life. You know, people used to write me, and, um, you know, whenever I was having a tough day, man, I would sit in my room, and I would just read these letters. He's been thinking about you every day. He loves UT football and wanted you to get this and get better. How can you not look at this when you're going through one of the toughest times of your life and smile? A kid, four years old, man. It's amazing. I seen plenty of talented guys get hit in the mouth and they didn't want it. I seen plenty of talented guys get punched in the face and they go back to the sideline and they stand beside their coach and they don't want it no more. And I seen the guy that's mediocre, I seen the guy that can't run faster than everybody, I seen the guy that's not stronger than everybody, I seen the guy that's not quicker than everybody, and when that third and one came, he stepped up and he said, Coach, I want that. Give me that. Give me that play. I'm so proud. It's like, not just because he's my son, that's one thing, but the man that he's grown to become out of all the things that he's been through. He's amazing. He is amazing. Gives you hope way beyond football that if Inky can overcome all this and then come right back and use what, he, what has happened to him to encourage people, he encourages me. He's riding along and going whatever direction God takes him to, and he's okay with that. Jeremiah 29, 11 reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. I feel like I'm living that plan out. I feel like the things that happen to us in life, they're not designed to stop us. They're designed to reposition us so we can come in contact with what God really has for us. And so everything that, that I do, man, I do it to honor God because I feel like God gave me a second chance at life. And so I feel like I'm doing what God put me on this earth to do.